or good morning and welcome to church. We come together from apart to worship our God, who is love. He is full of grace and compassion, and he wants us to be people of grace and compassion too. In studying Jonah these last few weeks, we have seen him, a person who is selfish and mean-spirited. We have seen his attitude towards the lost reflect a heart that is devoid of grace and is proud of his knowledge of God. And it reminded me this week that I am no more deserving of God's grace than anyone else is. And too often I have a heart that is hard towards the lost. So let's be encouraged this morning as we devote this time to worshipping our great and powerful and compassionate God, to love our enemies as God loves them, to love others as God loves them, and to love the lost as God loves them. Let us be encouraged to be humble in how we approach our great God, knowing that we are no more deserving of his grace than the Ninevites were, or indeed, as Jonah was. Let's pray and ask God for forgiveness. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Mortals give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. Our gracious and heavenly Father, prepare us this morning as we come before you and as we worship you. Forgive us, Lord, for we have sinned more than we know and often more than we admit. We are guilty of pride and of selfishness, guilty of looking upon others as somehow less deserving of your grace than we. 
Forgive us, we pray. Forgive us as we neglect to find you in our daily lives. Our lives quickly accrue a list of crimes that condemn us and show us to be well short of what you ask of us. Subdue our failings and corruptions and give us the grace we need to live. Rule over our lives and fashion us in your image. We know that you are the God of compassion and of grace and that you are love. And we thank you that you wish our good and you act for our good and for our salvation. Thank you for protecting us from our fallen longings. Cut out from us our sinful desires and wash us clean of our sin. Deliver us from every evil habit and build in us godly habits that edify and purify us. Draw us to you in prayer and fill us with a thirst for your word. May your spirit work in us to make us upright and allowing us to stay the course and to stand firm. We praise you, Father, for your great love, your faithfulness and your compassion. Your promises are true and your edicts are right and just. We know that it is through you that we stand firm. Forever you will love us and forever we will stand in your grace. You give us your spirit to help us and shape us. And so soften our hearts and work in us, we pray. Help us to bear good fruit for your kingdom as we show love to the lost and those in need. Your faithfulness keeps us steady when all else is shaky. Your word is a lamp at our feet, guiding our decisions and keeping us in your arms. And yet we also pray that when the harvest is plentiful and our hearts are light, that we equally turn to you. Amen. Hello. Today's passage is from Jonah, chapter 3. Please read with me. Jonah chapter 3. I'm reading from the NIV. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Amen. Hi, kids. Have you ever had a friend at school who said or did something that really upset you? It happens to most of us. What about in your family? It's hard right now because that's who we're spending most of our time with. A lot of time. What happens when that person actually says sorry to you and wants to be friends again? Do you forgive them? Do you give them a second chance? That's what God wants us to do. And today we'll see how Jonah and the Ninevites learnt that very important lesson too. Now, we've been looking at Jonah's story for the last two weeks. Let's recap. So God directed Jonah to go to Nineveh to tell the very wicked people there to turn from their evil ways and turn back to God. So remember, Jonah went the other way. Instead of going to Nineveh, he wanted to get as far away from Nineveh as he could. Then on that ship, there was a huge storm. Remember? 
Jonah told the sailors to throw him overboard after praying to their gods didn't work. So they threw him overboard. And after that happened, the sailors turned to God and believed him. So there's Jonah. Oops. Jonah was swallowed by a huge fish. And he stayed in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. There he is, looking pretty sad. So, what did Jonah learn? Remember, God knows what's best for us, even if we're scared. Jonah prayed to God from inside the fish. He promised to worship God. Then God made the fish spit Jonah out. But it's always better to go God's way. Remember that memory verse? In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Proverbs 3, 6. Let's see what happened to Jonah. Remember, God made the fish spit Jonah out. Then Jonah did go to Nineveh. Jonah preached the word of God to Nineveh. And the people were sad and upset. They repented and worshipped God. See, there he is, preaching them, and they're very happy now. God forgave them and gave them a second chance. The people listened and they did repent. They turned completely away from their bad behaviour. And they said sorry to God. And that second memory verse was, God's mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lamentations 3, 23. So that's what God wants us to do. So God wants us to turn away from our sin and also to forgive those who do wrong to us. God gives everyone second chances. Can you? Let's pray this prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that in your mercy you give second chances to those who repent. Please forgive us and help us to forgive others. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, uh, the God who loves the whole world so much that you'd send Jesus, that anyone who believes in him won't perish but have eternal life. Uh, we thank you for this story, this, uh, this passage today that reminds us that you are a God who loves to save people and that you will do whatever it takes uh, to bring in your children from every t tribe and nation and tongue. Uh, we pray that we would catch more of who you are and uh, who you would have us be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's nothing like a brush with death to get your attention, to clarify your priorities. Uh, it's the biggest wake-up call there is. Uh, I know a few of you have faced a brush with death recently. Maybe this global pandemic will be the wake-up call that our world needs. Perhaps it'll make people take a fresh look at their life, at their choices, their priorities, make them realise they're not masters of their own destiny. Perhaps we'll see some changes in how people approach life, uh, how they approach one another, how they relate to God. Uh, that's certainly what I'm praying uh, through this situation. A brush with death and a wake-up call. It's what we see in the book of Jonah. In fact, we see it twice. Uh, first, Jonah himself experiences it. Chapter 2, we saw it last week. He's thrown overboard into the stormy sea. He's sinking like a stone and he finally turns to God. Save me, God. Rescue me. And God does. Amazingly, mercifully, he saves him from death. Miraculously, a giant fish swallows him. And somehow, Jonah is alive. And he's grateful. And he wants to head to the temple in Jerusalem to offer his sacrifice. And chapter 2 finishes with God causing the fish to vomit Jonah up. And that's where we take up the story in chapter 3. Jonah's on dry land. He's safe and sound. 
perhaps trying to get his bearings about what direction Jerusalem is so he can head there to offer his sacrifice. But it's there the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time. Same as before, verse 2, almost exactly the same words as chapter 1. Same destination, same job, same message. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Call out to it. But remember, the only calling out that Jonah has agreed to do so far is as he's sinking down under the ocean, calling out to God in prayer to save himself. The last time Jonah heard the command, Jonah disobeyed. He ran away. But now he's had a brush with death. He's had the wake-up call. So he's learned his lesson. He's not going to make that mistake again. Uh, So this time, verse 3, Jonah obeys the word of the Lord. But Jonah's not the only one who has a near-death experience because the Ninevites do as well. They get their wake-up call because when Jonah eventually makes it to Nineveh, he gives them God's message. And it's pretty simple and straight to the point. Do you see it there in verse 4? 40 more days and Nineveh will be destroyed. It's even more stark in Hebrew. It's five words in Hebrew. Back in chapter 1, God's command had been go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Is that what Jonah's done? Did he preach more than these uh, five words? If not, should he have preached more than this? We're left with lots of questions as we read the description. It would have taken Jonah perhaps a month or two to travel to Nineveh from the shores of the Mediterranean up to uh, Assyria. Plenty of time to to work up a wonderful evangelistic sermon. Finely crafted, clear, comprehensive, engaging, powerful, contextualised. But the best he can do is 40 more days and Nineveh will be destroyed. It's a message that nothing more, nothing less than a death sentence. He's certainly preaching against Nineveh, like God said, but there's no two ways to live. There's no message of hope or forgiveness. There's no, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. No radical surgery to choose. No experimental drugs to try. It's a death sentence. There's no mention of the problem, their sin. There's not even any mention of the God who will bring the judgment. Just a death sentence, 40 more days, then judgment. What do you do with a message like that? It's the decision patients who are given only weeks to live have to make. When the doctor says, I'm sorry, there's nothing more I can do, You've got a month or two. What do they do? Uh, Do you just give up and and withdraw? Do you sit in a corner and feel sorry for yourself? Uh, Just fade away? Or do you get out there and enjoy your time? Do you make the most of it? And how do you make the most of your time? Do you satisfy yourself? Do Do you max out the credit card? Eat, drink and be merry? Work through the items on your bucket list? Or do you do something bigger and better? Do you leave a legacy behind? Do you set up a charitable trust? Or do you just gather your family around you and enjoy the time you have left? The historian Thucydides uh, records that in 430 BC, a terrible plague hit the city of Athens. It was less than 200 years later than Jonah and Nineveh. Greece was the equivalent world superpower of its day. Athens was the capital of the Greek Empire. And in this city, people were facing death every day. What was their response? Well, Thucydides reports that they committed every horrible crime and engaged in every lustful pleasure they could find. They believed that life was short, so they'd never have to pay the penalty. It was anarchy. 
and perhaps that's what we'd expect from the Ninevites. But it didn't happen like that because Jonah's message, brief as it was, it cuts them to the core. It convicted them despite the lack of conviction from Jonah himself, despite his impure motives, his lack of prayer, despite his lack of effort. Did you notice? It's a city that takes three days to travel through. Verse 4, Jonah sets foot into the gates on the first day. He delivers his message and that's all we hear. But that message, limited as it was, it worked. The people took his words as if they were words from the mouth of God. Even though Jonah had never mentioned God. Did you notice verse 5? The Ninevites believed who? They believed God. Now that explains the powerful effect because it was God's spirit who worked through Jonah's efforts to convict the people. And the people did something about it. They declared a fast and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. Jonah delivers his bare message to whoever happened to be listening there on that street corner and the news spreads like wildfire. This is the wake-up call they need. One person tells two, who tells four and eight and sixteen. And before long the news reaches the king. In verse six, he rises from his throne. And if we just stop there for a moment and, and we expect a, an announcement from the king, we expect a pronouncement of aggressive independence, maybe the sentence of death for the messenger. After all, this is the king of the Assyrians, uh, the world's first superpower. He's the leader of a cruel, wicked, dominant nation. But no, he too is cut to the core. He gets up to go down. He takes off his royal robes, the symbol of his sovereignty, and he, and he picks up sackcloth instead. And then he sits down in the dust. But that's not all. He issues a command for everyone else to do the same. Verse 7, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Everyone's to fast, even the animals. He even wants the animals wearing sackcloth, just as the king uh, is doing. The picture is of the whole city mourning for their sin from the top of society to the bottom. But not just mourning, pleading with God to change his mind. Verse 8, let everyone call urgently to God. There's that word again. The very thing Jonah's been reluctant to do, to call out. And yet it's the first thing the king wants people to do. And he goes further than Jonah does. He doesn't just call out to God, he repents. And he calls on the whole city to repent. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Turn from their wickedness. That word turn, it, it's used all the way through the Old Testament for repentance. Stop. Uh, stop going in one direction. Turn around and head in the other. Show your change of heart with a change of behaviour. And just perhaps, he thinks, there's a chance they can convince God to change his mind. Uh, verse 9, the king continues, Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. In the face of it, it it's wishful thinking. After all, there's nothing but misery in Jonah's message. There's no hope. It's 100% definite destruction. 40 more days and Nineveh will be destroyed. But who knows, he thinks. We're desperate. What have we got to lose? And yet if you think about it, perhaps there is some hope. Because if God really did send Jonah, like he said, if God's gone to the trouble of dragging Jonah all the way from where he was to Nineveh, 
then just perhaps God's expecting some response from the Ninevites. If he really was determined to destroy them, then why warn them? And so the king thinks we've got nothing to lose. Everyone, animals included, fast, mourn, pray, repent. And who knows? Maybe, just maybe, God might show compassion and turn from his anger. They heard the message, they believed it, but that's not all. Belief produced a change of heart and that conviction was seen in their sorrow. But, but more than sorrow, sorrow has to stir you to action. There are many people caught up in all sorts of sins, in, in drug addiction or sexual immorality or, or gambling who are miserable. They're full of sorrow, but it's often self-pity which is a long way from repentance. Now repentance is what we see here. It's, it's true repentant sorrow because it leads to action. The external actions, there's the sackcloth and the ashes and the fasting. But more than that, the king calls them to pray, to plead their case before God. But they don't just leave it with God, they give up their evil ways. They turn from their violence. There's an internal change that accompanies their prayer. That's what godly sorrow does. True repentance is seen in a changed life. What about you? If you're stuck in some sin that's just got a hold of you and you can't seem to beat it, you don't know where to turn, you've repented again and again, but there's no change then let me ask, what actions have you done that show that repentance? Jesus said if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He's advocating drastic action. And the more lingering a sin is, the more drastic the action that's required. Have you removed yourself from the temptation? It might mean leaving your job, getting another job. It might mean selling that boat, disconnecting the internet, finding some new friends, moving house. Remove yourself from the temptation. And who have you called in to help you? Who, who have you told about your struggle? Who keeps you accountable and, and prays with you? What changes have you made to your surroundings, to your habits, to those triggers? Uh, that make it difficult for you, that cause you to stumble. True repentance is seen in action. Well, what does God think of all this? What does he think of the Ninevites' actions? He's the one they've been doing it all for. Have they done enough? Were their prayers earnest enough? Was their repentance real? Well, verse 10 tells us that God does take notice. He sees their actions, the sackcloth, the fasting. He hears their prayers. He sees all the animals walking around in sackcloth. But more, impo more important, he sees their changed hearts. He sees genuine, repentant, turned around lives. And that's something you can't manufacture or pretend. Look at verse 10. When God saw what they did, and how they turned from their evil ways. He had compassion, and he did not bring upon them the destruction he threatened. The king had hoped that if the people turned, that God might turn, and God did. His anger replaced with forgiveness and compassion. His judgment replaced with mercy. Now, of course, that's what God had wanted to do all along. The whole reason he, he called Jonah and brought him from Israel in the first place was that so the Ninevites might turn and be forgiven. It's what he wants. It's what he, uh, it's what he always wants for people. His desire. 2 Peter 3.9 tells us that God is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Uh, that's his desire. He longs for people to recognise him. And so he sent not only Jonah, but Jesus. 
He gave us his Bible that we might hear his word and be convicted. And then that conviction would lead to sorrow and that sorrow would lead to action, to a repentance, to a turning around. God wants us to repent the way the Ninevites did. Is that something you're doing? It's something you don't do just once. It's something that we keep doing. You see, the original audience for the book of Jonah was the the nation of Israel. Jonah was a wake-up call for Israel. Israel were a people who'd grown cold to God. For generations they'd heard the warnings, they'd listened to the prophets, they'd read the book, they'd repented and sacrificed again and again, but they'd wandered away. Uh, The prophet Amos lived around the same time as Jonah and he describes how wicked and corrupt Israel had become. They were caught up in sexual immorality. They abused the poor and the widows. They denied justice to the oppressed. There were greed and self-centeredness all the way through Jewish society. And, And through the book of Jonah, God is saying to them, Israel, that's what your repentance needs to look like. It needs to look like Nineveh. It's got to look like something. Like the king and his people learn from Nineveh. It would be a staggering message Their repentance needed to be like Nineveh, to be wholehearted and sorrowful and prayerful. God says, that's what I'm after. If they can do it, how much more can you do it? After all, Nineveh didn't know the covenant God of Israel. They had none of the privileges that Israel had. Do you remember the king's words? Who knows? God might turn. But you see, Israel did know. They did know the God who was gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Or let's go one step further. There's us. We know even better than Israel, better than Nineveh, because we know God's Son. We know Jesus. We've seen the compassion and the love and the forgiveness and the mercy and the patience of God in the person of Jesus. We know the promises of verses like Romans 8.32. God, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Or a bit further down in Romans 8.38. I'm convinced that neither death, life, angels, demons, the present, the future, nor any powers, height, depth, anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We know the love of God in Jesus. The king of Nineveh said, who knows? But we know. Do we recognise our sin the way Nineveh did? Are we convicted and sorrowful like Nineveh? Does it lead to action? Are there real changes that show the genuineness of our repentance? Or is it all just words? Is it all just staying where we are? But not only that, the message of Jonah is good news for us as we tell that message to people. Because if God can turn around the king of Nineveh, then he can reach anyone. The wickedest king, the the wicked king of the most wicked empire. If he can turn him around, well, then the good news about Jesus can change the high court judge or the prostitute. The good news of Jesus can turn around the university academic or the bikey, the radical feminist, the broken, depressed, single mum. You see, there's no one beyond God's reach. And what's more, 
God brought about that radical repentance using Jonah. So, so if God can use Jonah to achieve his salvation purposes, then, well, God can use anyone. He, he can even use me and you. If God can bring about such a powerful change in Nineveh using Jonah's simple message, then he can do something with my words. If you think about it, there are always plenty of opportunities for us to speak to our friends about God and his salvation message, our workmates, our family, our neighbours. And if the book of Jonah teaches us anything, it's this. God wants to show those people mercy more than you want to speak to them. God wants to show them mercy even more than you want to speak to them. So look for those opportunities. Pray for them to happen. Pray that you'll have the courage and the wisdom to take the opportunities. Let's not be comfortable like Jonah, like Israel. Let's not take God's mercy for granted like Israel. Let's remember the mercy that God's shown us in Jesus and let's pass it on. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Help us to understand the love that you have for all people. Uh, let it change us. Let it produce in us a repentance of changed lives. Uh, we pray that the love you have for all nations uh, would be seen in you calling them to yourself. And we pray, dear God, that you might use us as part of your purposes, just as you used Jonah, for your honour and glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
we're here today with Diego all the way from Loja in Ecuador. Welcome, Diego. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. So tell me, Diego, what's what's your average week look like at the moment? We're sort of in the middle of two months of lockdown and our life's, you know, fairly limited. So tell us tell us yeah. what things are like for you. Um, well, I think with COVID have improved, so things are getting a slightly more or coming more to normal, if I can say so. Uh, so during the week, every day in the afternoons, I spend my time here. This is a library bookshop that John, um, John Woodhouse started when he was here back to, I don't know, 15 years ago or something like that. And now this is where I, yeah, I help. I help to, to run this place. And yeah, so this is basically my afternoons and mornings, Monday and Tuesday, we'll be basically doing some, some prep for my Bible study on Tuesday night. Tuesday afternoon, I got my prayer meeting with you and all the guys from, from church. And yeah, and the rest of the time is mainly admin and things that I might pop in during the week, but uh, uh, I would say that w- that's basically my normal week. Sunday, uh, Saturdays, catch up with you, catch up with you on um, uh, just on the on the service. So I do follow the, the service on, on YouTube, and Sunday go to church. So I so, have been able to go to church since the last maybe two months. Oh, great! Okay, person. nice. Yeah, we're looking forward to being able to get back together meeting. Um, so what, what's encouraging in ministry for you at the moment? Uh, I think it, the most encouraging thing has been the Bible study. Um, probably uh, you have heard um, most of those guys, uh, they don't come from a religious background. Some, some do, but I see how the Holy Spirit has been working them. So through this time studying the Bible, I can definitely see them having a more, more clear picture about what the gospel is and how the way they interpret the scripture, how they read the Bible. So uh, yeah, that's been really, really encouraging. It is a small process, um, mm. but when I compare this time like a year ago, yeah, it's definitely a, a massive progress. Mm. In some of them. Yeah, it's always exciting to see people getting excited about the Bible and understanding it. And, yeah, realizing God speaking to them. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. So, w- what are the challenges? Uh, just the flip side of that. What are what are some challenges that you're facing? Um, yeah. Well, I guess COVID has brought uh, challenges for everyone. In my case, uh, for ministry, uh, we had been just thinking and trying to do ministry during this time. So um, I was like recording some videos, hoping that they will get used in the radio program. That was the idea. Um, but so far that nothing has happened and probably nothing will happen. Although people have said yes. So I guess that's, that's challenging. Perhaps I just need to relearn um, a bit more of my culture and how to really interact with people when my, they some might say yes but that doesn't necessarily mean yes and yeah so things like that have uh, been perhaps just working on trying to start but that might not uh, going the way that I thought it would so that's a bit challenging I guess yeah how, how is the radio station going have you got much to do with that um well, the radio is, is now is um, broadcasting, which is really good. And uh, well, I'm I'm friend I'm a friend with the guy who is in charge. But apart from that, I'm not doing anything really. Yeah. Um, what's SIM planning? Have they got much planned between now and the end of the year? Yeah, two things are coming up. Um, so in September, we are hoping to start to finally start our first uh, Moklam or more College by Correspondence course here in Loja. So that's one thing that we are, we are really looking forward to start. 
And the uh, other big thing is the approaching conference that we are going to have on November. So this conference, we, we are having it with another um, ministry called the, the Siemens Trust uh, or the Charles Siemens Trust. And they focused on uh, expository preaching. So we, are be, we will be organizing the, the conference, but they will come and, and do, the, do the teaching. So this conference will be in another city called Guayaquil. That's a big city. And yeah, so we will need to um, try to organize things for another city <laughs> mm. or in another city. So which is, you know, bring some um, challenges. But yeah, so far things are going, going well. Looks promising. Hopefully yeah. we're, going, we're going to be able to, to have it. Yeah, I aimed at, at ministers and, and preachers and pastors. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea. Mm. So we hope to have about 100 pastors and preachers. Excellent. Yes, hopefully by then most of them will be vaccinated. And yeah, so hopefully we'll be, yeah. And will uh, you have much, much part to play in the More College by Correspondence course? Are you involved in that? Yes, I will be teaching the course. Yeah, excellent. Along another, another friend. Yeah. yeah, so that's something that I've been really looking forward to. Because, and that's, yeah, I've been that's feeling a, that. Yeah, that's aimed at lay people, can, isn't it? Yeah, just. Yeah. 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 yeah, great. And that'll just be people from Loja or? Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, well, we are hoping to then probably start another, another course by soon, but yeah. so far this, this one will be just uh, people in Loja. Yeah, okay. So um, next question, we're a long way away from you. You know, we were hoping to be there last year, but that's um, right. <laughs> we're, we're feeling the distance. So how can we be encouraging you from, you know, this far away? Um, I would say just keep doing what you are doing. Keep praying for, for me. Um, I think that's really encouraging when I follow the, the services and sometimes you, you do pray for me. So that's been really, really encouraging because, um, yeah, it is a realization that I'm not here by myself, although this is, this is home for me. But it is really good to know that there is a, a body of believers who are really praying and they are really committed to the work of the gospel here in Ecuador. So please keep doing that. Um, you keep organizing the Bible, uh, the prayer meetings on, on Tuesday or Wednesday mm. the time. So that's mm. encouraging. Yeah, okay. And that, that's a good lead in, I guess, to my last question, which is what are some things we can be praying for? Yeah. So please keep uh, pray for these two events that we are hoping to have the, the conference and the mocking course pray for that um, pray that God will lead or bring good people or the right people I guess for, for the course and the, and the conference as well for all the planning and all, all of that um, yeah in my case please pray that I will grow my network of connections here in Loja Although I've been, have, I've been, since I came back, it's almost two, two years, has mm. been almost two years, but it's still because of COVID and many other things that, yeah, I don't have that many friends. So please mm. pray for that. That will be really good for ministry wise, but also personally. And mm. um, yeah, so maybe those, those things. Great. We will certainly do that. It's, uh, it's been great to catch up with you, Diego, and uh, God bless. Oh, thank you. God bless you. Hi, my name's Alex, and I'm going to be praying for um, ourselves, for our church, and for our world. So please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for time spent together hearing your word this morning. Lord, we so desperately miss worshipping together. Help us to be comforted and encouraged, knowing that our brothers and sisters are sitting together in other places, worshipping you. Lord, we are so sorry for the times this week that we have not rested in you, in your word, or called out to you in prayer. Lord, we think of all the times this week where we have tried to do it on our own. Lord, we pray that you will help us to trust, to lean on you when we are feeling burdened. Lord, we thank you for the message that you have for us today. Thank you that you give us second chances. 
We thank you for the mirror that Jonah has been to us in the last few weeks. We pray that as we continue to wrestle with the story of Jonah, that you will be encouraging us to remember that you are a missional God, that you make a way to seek and save the lost. And we pray that you will be helping us to ask you to use us. And I pray that you will be helping us to say yes when opportunities come up to share the good news, the hope that we have in you. Thank you for your church. We thank you for the leaders in our church here at Ashfield. We pray for the employment of a pastoral assistant here. We pray that your hand will be over that process and we ask that you will bring the right person to Ashfield, someone who will be an encouragement and will lead us as we continue to serve one another and serve Ashfield. Lord, we lift up many of the ministries that are taking place at the moment in different ways. We pray that you will be giving those leaders wisdom and energy in a time that is really difficult. Even though Zoom can be great, it can be tiring. And I pray that you will continue to build up your people, even in times where we feel so disconnected. Lord, we pray for Australia. We pray that you will continue to give wisdom to leaders who are making decisions regarding policies about health and work and education and travel. Lord, we pray that you'll protect the vulnerable, help those who are sick and in pain. Please give wisdom to doctors and nurses and healthcare staff. And Lord, we pray for protection. Heavenly Father, we think of our new Year 12 students at the moment. We thank you for technology that has allowed them to continue with their learning. We pray that you will give them endurance and peace as they navigate announcements regarding extended study sessions before their exams. We just pray that you will give the government wisdom in the decisions they make regarding our young people. We pray for Leela. We pray that you will give her protection as she travels to the UK to study and for Iris as she works towards returning to WA for work. We pray for those who are feeling isolated. Help us to remember to text, to call, to notice, to ask, to be generous with those who need it. Lord, we pray for the Sarkozy's whose daughter is having a baby. We pray for a smooth delivery for a healthy baby and we pray that they will be able to be reunited as a family soon so that Stephen and Cheryl can cuddle their grandchild. Lord, we lift our eyes and pray for everyone in and affected by what's happening in Afghanistan. With this increasing news of deaths and violence, we ask you to quickly bring peace and stability to that nation. We especially pray for women who are fearing, who are now fearing for their lives and fearing what living under the Taliban will mean for them. We pray for comfort for those grieving the deaths of their family members in the bloodshed so far. We pray for the Christians there. We pray that they might be safe and that they will be able to show great kindness to others and that through their actions, people might turn to Christ. We pray for the wisdom of our political leaders, that they might make decisions to care for the vulnerable and oppressed, and to promote justice and peace. We pray for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.